All right, ladies, continuing on with tradition number three. Um, we are going to read the short form from page 562, the long form from page 563, um, and then 12 by 12, and the questions. All right, so short form of the 12 traditions, number three. The only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. The long form states, Our membership ought to include all who suffer from alcoholism. Hence, we may refuse none who wish to recover. Nor ought AA membership ever depend upon money or conformity. Any two or three alcoholics gathered together for sobriety may call themselves an AA group, provided that, as a group, they have no other affiliation. And from the illustrated pamphlet, which I actually really like this one, isn't every organization entitled to have rules for membership? Why did AA decide to forego this privilege to be inclusive, never exclusive? That's easy. Early members tried it the other way, and it just didn't work. As the fellowship was nearing its 10-year mark, the office that served as headquarters asked the groups to list their membership rules and send it in. Bill W. recalled, if all of these edicts had been in force everywhere at once, it would have been practically impossible for any alcoholic to have ever joined AA. About nine-tenths of our oldest and best members could never have got by. So the rule books went out the window and were replaced by one uncomplicated sentence, Tradition 3. But, somebody may ask, isn't this tradition itself a rule? Do, it does state one requirement for membership. Let's read it again and ask another question. Who determines whether or not newcomers qualify, whether they do want to stop drinking? Obviously, nobody except the newcomers themselves. Everybody else simply has to take their word for it. In fact, they don't even have to say it out loud. And that's fortunate for many of us who arrived in AA with only a half-hearted desire to stay sober. We are alive because the AA road stayed open to us. The problem faced by this tradition isn't just past AA history. It keeps coming up, for instance. When a group debates whether to exclude alcoholics who have problems other than alcohol or who have differing lifestyles, the tradition mentioned no such additional requirements, no demand that prospective members must not have a history of drug abuse, a certain lifestyle, or an institutional background. All alcoholics are welcome. But what about the group that seems to impose extra requirements beyond a desire to stop drinking. This might be a special interest group or a collection of groups in which, for example, each physician, each member must be a physician or a young person, a man, a woman, a priest, or a law enforcement officer. By their own account, those attending special interest groups consider themselves AI members first. They attend general membership meetings as well as those that fill their other individual needs, and they remain devoted to AA's primary purpose. These special interest groups offer only one instance of the diverse and inclusive membership within our fellowship. Our traditions allow unparalleled freedom, not only to every AA member, but to every AA group. Now we will go to the 12 by 12 and tradition three starts on page 139 and Karen P you had your hand up first so could you please read us 139. Tradition three 
the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. This tradition is packed with meaning. For AA really saying to every serious drinker, you are an AA member if you say so. You can declare yourself in. Nobody can keep you out. No matter who you are, no matter how low you've gone, no matter how grave your emotional complications, even your crimes, we can't deny you. AA, we, we don't want to keep you out. We aren't a bit afraid you'll harm us, never mind how twisted or violent you may be. We just want to be sure that you get the same chance for sobriety that we have. So you're an AA member the minute you declare yourself. To establish this principle of membership took years of harrowing experience. In our early time, nothing seemed so fragile, so easily breakable as an AA group. Hardly an alcoholic we approached paid any attention. Most of those who did join us were like flickering candles in a windstorm. Time after time, their uncertain flames blew out and couldn't be relit, relighted. Our unspoken constant thought was, which of us may be next? A member gives us a vivid glimpse of those days at one time. He says every AA group had many membership rules. Everybody was scared witless that something or somebody would capsize the boat and dump us all back into the drink. Our foundation office asked each group to send in its list of protective regulations. The total list was a mile long. If all those rules had been in effect everywhere, nobody could have been possibly joined AA at all. So great was the sum of our anxiety and fear. Pass. All right, Della. Whoops. Good morning, ladies. Della Alcoholic. We were resolved to admit no bait from AA, but that hypothetical class of people were termed pure alcoholics, except for their guzzling and the unfortunate results thereof. They could have no other complications. So beggars, tramps, asylum inmates, prisoners, queers, plain crackpots, and fallen women were definitely out. Yes, sir, we've catered only to pure and respectful alcoholics. Any others would surely destroy us. Besides, if we took those odd ones, what would descend? people say about us? What would decent people say about us? We built a fine mesh fence right around AA. Maybe this sounds comical now. Maybe you think old timers were pretty intolerant, but I can tell you there was nothing funny about the situation then. We were grim because we felt our lives and homes were threatened, and that was no laughing matter. Intolerant, you say? Well, we were frightened. Naturally, we be and to act like most everybody does when afraid. After all, isn't fear the truth, the true basis of intolerance? Yes, we were intolerant. How could we then guess that all those fears would prove groundless? How could we know that thousands of these sometimes frightening people were to make astonishing recoveries and become our greatest workers and intimate friends? Was this credible that AA was to have a divorce rate far lower than average? Could we then foresee that troublesome people were to become our principal teachers of patience and tolerance? Could any then, um, could any then imagine a society which would include every conceivable kind of character and cut across every barrier of race, creed, politics, and language with ease? All right, Yvonne. Hi, I'm Yvonne. I'm an alcoholic. Why did AA finally drop all its membership regulations? Why did we leave it to each newcomer to decide himself whether he was an alcoholic and whether he should join us? Why did we dare to say, contrary to the experience of society and government everywhere, that we would neither punish nor deprive any AA of membership, that we must never compel anyone to pay anything, believe anything, or conform to anything. The answer, now seen in Tradition 3, was simple simplicity itself. At last experience taught us 
that to take away any alcoholic's full chance was sometimes to pronounce his death sentence and often to condemn him to endless misery. Who dared to be judge, jury, and executioner of his own sick brother? As group after group saw these possibilities, they finally abandoned all membership regulations. One dramatic experience after another clinched this determination until it became our universal tradition. Here are two examples. On the AA calendar, it was year two. In that time, nothing could be seen but two struggling, nameless groups of alcoholics trying to hold their faces up to the light. A newcomer appeared at one of these groups, knocked on the door, and asked to be let in. He talked frankly with the group's oldest member. He soon proved that he was a desperate case and that above all, he wanted to get well. But, he asked, will you let me join our group? Since I'm a victim of another addiction, even worse stigmatized than alcoholism, you may not want me among you, or will you? Pass. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Pam G. I'm Pam. I'm an alcoholic. There was the dilemma. What should the group do? The oldest member summoned to others. And in confidence, laid the explosive facts in their laps. Said he, Well, what about it? If we turn this man away, he'll soon die. If we allow him in, only God knows what trouble he'll prove. What shall the answer be? Yes or no? At first, the elders could look only at the ob objections. We deal, they said, with alcoholics only. Shouldn't we sacrifice? Sacrifice this one for the sake of the many. So went the discussion while the newcomer's fate hung in the balance. Then one of the three people spoke in a very different voice. What we are really afraid of, he said, is our reputation. We are much more afraid of what people might say than the trouble the strange alcoholic might bring. As we've been talking, five short words have been running through my mind. Something keeps repeating to me. What would the master do? Not another word was said. What more indeed could, could be said? Overjoyed, the newcomer plunged into 12 step work. Tirelessly, tirelessly he laid A's message before scores of people. Since this was a very early group, those scores have since multiplied themselves into thousands. Never did he trouble anyone with his other difficulty. AA had taken his first step in the formation of Tradition 3. Thank you, Pam. All right. Yvette. Oh, where'd she go? Yvette, can you unmute yourself? All right, we'll skip down to Susan. Family, my name is Susan. I'm an alcoholic. I'm grateful to be here. Um, we're at the top of page 143. Is that right? Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Not long after the man with double di with double stigma knocked for admission, AA's other group received into its membership a salesman we shall call Ed. A power driver, this one, and brash as any salesman could possibly be. He had at least an idea a minute on how to improve AA. These ideas he sold to fellow members with the same burning enthusiasm with which he distributed automobile polish. But he had one idea that wasn't so saleable. Ed was an atheist. His pet obsession was that AA could get along better without its God nonsense. He browbeat everybody, and everybody expected that he'd soon get drunk. For at the time, you see, AA was on the pious side. There must be a heavy penalty, it was thought, for blasphemy. Distressingly enough, Ed proceeded to stay sober. At length, time came for him to speak in a meeting. We shivered, for we knew what was coming. He paid a fine tribute to the fellowship. He told how his family had been reunited. He extolled the virtue of honesty. He recalled the joys of the 12-step 12 12 step work. 
And then he lowered the boom. Cried, Ed, I can't take this God stuff. I can't stand this God stuff. It's a lot of malarkey for weak folks. This group doesn't need it, and I won't have it to hell with it. I'll pass. All right. Marianne. Hi, I am Marianne, alcoholic. A great wave of outrage, resentment engulfed the meeting, sweeping every member to a single resolve. Out he goes. The elders led Ed aside. They said firmly, you can't talk like this around here. You'll have to quit, quit it or get out. With great sarcasm, Ed came back at them. Now do tell, is that so? He reached over to a bookshelf and took up a sheaf of papers. On top of them lay the foreword to the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, then under preparation. He read aloud, the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. Relentlessly, Ed went on, when you guys wrote that sentence, did you mean it or didn't you? Dismayed, the elders looked at one another, for they knew he had them cold, so Ed stayed. Ed not only stayed, he stayed sober, month after month. The longer he kept dry, the louder he talked against God. The group was in anguish so deep that all fraternal charity had vanished. When, oh when, grown members to one another, will that guy get drunk? Quite a while later, Ed got a sales job, which took him out of town. At the end of a few days, the news came in. He'd sent a telegram for money, and everybody knew what that meant. Then he got on the phone. In those days, we'd go anywhere on a 12-step job, no matter how I'm promising. But this time, nobody stirred. Leave him alone. Let him try it by himself for once. Maybe he'll learn a lesson. Pass. All right. Yvette, you popped up. I'm back. Hi, hi. Is that alcoholic? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, anyway, I had a call and I messed up. Can I read? The, can I read? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So we're oh, at okay. quite a I while think. later. Quite a while later, Ed got a sales job, which took him out of town. At the end of a few days, the news came in. He'd sent a telegram for money, and everyone knew what that meant. Then he got on the phone. In those days, we'd go anywhere on a 12-step job, no matter how unpromising. But this time, nobody stirred. Leave him alone. Let him try it by himself for once. Maybe he'll learn a lesson. About two weeks later, Ed stole by night into AA member's house, and unknown to the family, went to bed. Daylight found the master of the house and another friend drinking their morning coffee. A noise was heard on the stairs. To their consternation, Ed appeared. A quizzical smile on his lips, he said, Have you fellows had your morning meditation? They quickly sensed that he was quite in earnest. In fragments, this story came out. In a neighboring state, Ed had holed up in a cheap hotel. After all, his pleas for help had been rebuffed. These words rang in his forever mind. They have deserted me. I have been deserted by my own kind. This is the end. Nothing is left. As he tossed on his bed, his hand brushed the bureau nearby, touching a book. Opening the book, he read, it was a Gideon Bible. Ed never confided any more of what he saw and felt in that hotel room. It was the year 1938. He hasn't had a drink since. Nowadays, when old-timers who knew Ed were gathered, they exclaimed, what if we had actually succeeded in throwing Ed out for blasphemy? What would have happened to him and all the others he, had, he later helped? So the land of Providence early gave us a sign that any alcoholic is a member of our society when he says so, or she says so. Thanks, Yvette. <laughs> Sorry. Awesome. Um, I love, love, love Tradition 3. Um, you know, I have a sister-in-law 
um, who has been a member of the fellowship for 27 years. Um, and as most of you know, my, my husband had been court ordered to Alcoholics Anonymous. So when I came to the rooms, I didn't think it worked. When I heard the old timers say that they had been sober for multiple years, I had these two people's examples in my mind and I thought AA didn't work. When I heard Tradition 3, it made a piece of that puzzle click where I was like, the only requirement of membership is a desire to stop drinking, not the mandatory requirement of stopping drinking. Um, and so I was able to give it a fair chance. I love this story um, at the beginning where uh, the New York office asked all of the groups to send in their rules for membership. Some of the rules were outrageous. I've gone over this with my service sponsor. Um, I would never have been able to be a member myself. Um, and they actually came out and said, you know, Bill and Bob would not have been allowed membership based on the rules. Um, so really glad they did that survey um, and that I don't have to wear a skirt to a meeting, um, and women weren't allowed to smoke either. <laughs> Not, I don't smoke anymore, but I did. All right, so let's go on to the questions. Uh, tradition three, the only requirement for AA membership is the desire to stop drinking. So these are the AA grapevine questions for the traditions. They are meant to invoke thought and conversation. Number one, in my mind, do I prejudge some new gonna try with the boys in my mind do I prejudge some new AA members as losers number two is there some kind of alcoholic whom I privately do not want in my AA group three do I set myself up as a judge of whether a newcomer is sincere or phony four do I let language religion or lack of it Race, education, age, or other such things interfere with my carrying the message? Am I over-impressed by a celebrity, by a doctor, a clergyman, or an ex-convict? Or can I just treat this new member simply and naturally as one more sick human like the rest of us? Six, when someone turns up at an AA needing information or help, even if he can't ask for it aloud, does it really matter to me what he does for a living, where he lives, what his domestic arrangements are, whether he had been to AA before, and what his other problems are? So great, great, great questions to start thought. Um, for me, the one that pops up is, um, you know, number five. Um, I've seen, especially in Vancouver, where we're Hollywood North, um, celebrities and prominent figures come into Alcoholics Anonymous, and some newer members who are not familiar with the traditions can get caught up in that. Um, and, and I love number six, where, you know, it doesn't matter who they are, where they come from, what they have. Um, but I like to know if they've been to AA before and what their other problems is as it helps me to help them. Um, but I don't use it as a factor of judgment. But I use it as a factor of, you know, I need to know things about you in order to know how to approach you. Um, so let's have a discussion and see what happens with Tradition 3. Would someone like to go first? Joanne! Everyone, I'm Joanne. I'm an alcoholic addict, and I am grateful to be here. And I, oh my God, I needed to read this tradition because um, I had an experience at another meeting that if I could have shoved this tradition book through the wire, I would have. I, uh, my heart broke. My heart broke, and I'll just share because there's a connection. So it was after the meeting. And there was share, and this young, you could tell there was a young voice who had a certain amount of time. And he said, he said, I've got, I've got some time. I think it was like two months. I've got two months sobriety, but I smoke dope. Should I, should I change my sobriety? And all these unified voices said, yes. That for me, with this tradition, that's not the response. The response is, 
you got two months of not drinking? Good for you. That must have been really friggin' hard for you. Okay? Acknowledge that he has not stopped drinking. It is not my place to, to, first of all, one word answers are not really good. They're just not really good. But, but to be able to say, you know, if you want to talk about it, because we're a program of attraction, not promotion. And, and there are people that have come into the meetings drunk and we have not asked them to leave. So if somebody comes in high, but they have a desire not to live the way they're living, they are welcome. And their journey is their journey. What we do, what we do in these traditions is we say in many different ways, but one is we found it's better to come into the program and, and try not to drink. Just today, try not to drink. It works better if you don't drink. It works better, and some of us have found it works better if you don't get high, okay? But it is their journey because it can get so complicated because the only requirement to AA membership is not time. It's not time. You And, and so... I listened to him and I thought to myself, I hope because one of alcoholics, you know, main characteristics is screw you. I hope he didn't say, shit, I failed. I failed. I can't do this. Screw this and leave. What we have to do is these traditions and say, good job on the not drinking. If you want to talk about the other thing, because you're bringing it up. We have, you know, talk to your sponsor, get some opinions. If it's, in, if it's making your life unmanageable, you know, you can do that. There are women that come in that say, you know, I'm getting sober. My husband gets drunk and beat me. If she said at the end of a meeting, should I leave my husband? And everyone said yes, that would be inappropriate. So I just, I'm really passionate about this because I cannot take responsibility for someone else's recovery. What I can say is I'll share my experience, strength, and hope. And if you have any inclination that alcohol is destroying your life, come, listen. And, and you can make a decision. Because I, no matter what I say, I can't get someone sober. And no matter what I say, I can't get someone drunk. I just have to say if you want what we have this is what we do and i know a number of people that over time made the decision to change their sobriety date because they define what sobriety for them beyond not picking up the drink was and that's their choice that's their choice um so anyways um we have to be careful about one word answers um because they wrote a whole book to avoid one word answers so that everyone could still come and get a chance, just get a chance to know what it's like to not drink today. So I'm done with my rant. I'm sorry. That's, that's it. Thanks. That's okay. And, 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 you know, I like how these traditions kind of roll through each other. So they're tradition too. There's one ultimate authority and that's, God, right? Um, as we express in our group conscience, but um, it was it was told to me there's some conversations we have in the corner of the room, and other conversations we have in the middle of the room, and that's one of those conversations where you can say this is one of those conversations we have in the corner of the room with just a few members. Then instead of having a group discussion like Joanne says, that can make it, you know go one way or one word answers. Ah, uh, thank you, Joanne. Susan. Hello, family. My name is Susan. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, I absolutely love this tradition also. Um, if there's any, was ever a doubt in my mind that this was ordained uh, by something higher than me, I think it, the perfect example is tradition three. Um, and if ever I doubt 
the we part of the program, you ladies allowed me for seven years to walk into the, your meetings and go in the bathroom and drink, smoke a joint, do a line of coke, come out and sit next to you and swear at you for seven straight years. You never told me I wasn't loved and I wasn't welcomed. I would have been dead if AA had turned their back on me because when I finally came back and, and got sober, I was homeless. You, you guys were the only thing I had. So thank you for honoring this tradition. Um, the, the questions were very thought provoking. I have heard them and done them before with my service sponsor as well. Um, I love uh, People Magazine and Entertainment Tonight. So when I see a celebrity, I'm all a Twitter. Now, I, I don't know that I treat them differently um, simply because I used to live with a musician. So I've met a bunch of famous people. So when I, when I got sober, it wasn't that big of a deal. But um, judging is, is not comfortable. I'm not, I, I judge. I do judge people. Um, it's much better than it used to be, obviously. Um, because I was, you know, everybody else was my higher power. And so I had to know what you were about to know if I was better than you or less than you. Um, so the more I realized who, who, who is not in charge and who is in charge, um, my ego continues to deflate. And so I try to treat people, you know, equally. I believe Dr. Bob, talked about anonymity. Um, when we walk in those rooms, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, Park Avenue or Park Bench, Yale or jail, we're all the same people. And and I have to remember that we're all sick people that are in the rooms that are alcoholics. I also will say that my personal drug of choice is more, whatever it may look like. And so my primary illness is that I'm an alcoholic. And so that's why I identify an AA. Um, And as far as when people walk in the rooms, depending on how they look, um, you know, in my today I was taught not to act on my thoughts. I probably do form an opinion. I, however, do not let that affect my service work, which means reaching out to that person, welcoming them as a newcomer and asking what help they need and getting them a big book and all the stuff we're, we're taught to do. And it also does not stop me from calling them. Um, I'm not in charge. God is. Um, so I'm grateful for this tradition. Um, I was just looking at the questions. Um, that's all I really have to say. I'm grateful to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Susan. I wish I could get you on the phone with one of my girls that's here. Um, she could use to hear your story. Um, Yvette! Yvette alcoholic. Thanks, Kimberly. Yeah, so grateful that, for the steps and the traditions, and I've heard so many good things even so far in Tradition 3. Yeah, I learn everything the hard way, it seems like, and thank God for sponsors and sponsees and everybody is sharing their experience, strength, and hope. And and I like that, the middle of the room, or the corner of the room, as opposed to the middle of the room, rather than sponsor or the meeting, because, you know, it's a wee program. Sometimes it's a small we or a big we. And um, we get to learn those things, you know. And the questions, I haven't heard those for a little while. And um, I got to read one, two, and three. And like Kimberly says, they all build on each other. And I was told that the steps are to the individual as the 12 traditions are to the group. And, you know, and um, and tradition three, going back to that, early on learning that with my sponsor's help, I think I had like 90 days and I was getting my 90 day chip and a gentleman sat next to me. It was a big meeting and he had a red face and he was with drunk and he smelled, you know, the type of thing. And I think I got a new pair of shoes. It was a fog and I know my sponsor said this isn't Princess Anonymous to me several times, but he said, keep coming back, don't drink between meetings, you know, that kind of thing. And thank God, by the grace of God. So anyway, so I called her after the meeting. I'm like, that guy was drunk in the meeting. And she's like, um, and? And I said, well, you're not allowed to do that. And she's like, let's read Tradition 3. 
okay? And next time you see that man, you give him a cup of coffee, you give him your seat, and you shake his hand. And you tell him welcome and keep coming to the balcony. Still gives me chills. She's like, where do you think you are, you know? And I never saw that man again. Um, but I remembered that. And then I got to relearn or kind of figure it out again. I was secretary at a closed meeting. And one of the guys said, oh, I guess you don't care about the traditions. You know, alcoholics. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what, but so I learned again, like, you know, that's where we say, do you have a desire to stop drinking? And if I have a desire to stop drinking, I'm allowed to, or like we read, I, I'm an alcoholic if I say I'm an alcoholic. And it's the only disease that we diagnose ourselves. So I'm just so grateful. I haven't spoke up in this meeting. I've been coming since we were kind of in the steps and I'm so grateful for the 12 steps of tradition 164 Kimberly all you guys love you guys I've been listening love you thanks and I just love everybody that's just been listening along it's it's absolutely amazing to see that after so many months people are you know putting their hands up and uh, and participating uh Lucia you're the next hand up please go ahead Lucia alcoholic. Um, I really like number six. Um, when I see somebody new coming in, um, like you said, Kimberly, it is really important for me to like get to know their background because the thing is I only know of alcoholism, like drugs, isn't a part of my story. Um, there's a lot that isn't a part of my story, but you know, and I don't believe in sharing an experience or, um, you know, uh, advice or give suggestions to something I haven't, I haven't had an experience with or am familiar with. And I know a lot of people come into AA because, um, you know, they like our sobriety or they think, you know, they feel we have a stronger fellowship in comparison to other things. But, you know, if drugs is their, um, you know, their thing, um, you know, I have, I have, uh, you know, I can refer them to connections and people who can better relate to them and have, you know, maybe um, just more to offer than what I could, right? Because I've I've seen so many people, and even myself in the beginnings, getting so excited to work with people and wanting to get into the book, and then halfway through discovering, like, they don't even, alcoholism isn't even a thing for them. Like, yes, they drank, but it was something else. And, you know, for me, it's, I mean, I love to help, but... Um, I'm not saying it's a waste of time, but it's just, it's probably not the right, uh, I guess, solution for them in a sense. Um, so, um, I love hearing everyone's stories and the more, the more stories I hear for me, then, um, you know, I'm better able to help people who, uh, you know, cross my paths in, in terms of referring them to the, the more appropriate solutions. But that's just, that's just what I think. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And and yeah, I've shared about that before. Um, I'm I am a great people connector. Um, I go to so many meetings in so many little areas of Vancouver that when I hear a story, I can connect with the right people. And and that's just a skill from from being an AA and from paying attention and whatever skill God gave me. And, and that's like what she said. If it's not part of my story and I can't relate, I'm not an expert in that area. I'm not, and I'm not a therapist. I'm not a a social worker. So, you know, it's great to say, you know what? I know a girl that has that same experience. And that's the humility we gain through this program. Yes, we, we may not get a sponsee that day, but we, we're still helping carry the message by connecting them. We're being um, a servant of the program by doing that and you know the universe and God work in mysterious ways and it'll all come around um, and you'll get a sponsee so we don't need to hoard them um, just because we want one so bad we want to make sure it's the right fit and I've said that before I was like you know I don't think I'm the right fit for you um, but I know someone that I think is and, and, you know, there's some tough cases where they're just not quite ready yet. And it's like, you want to take a stab at it? Because that hasn't clicked with me yet, right? And and it's okay. We don't need to 
collect them. There's a big old revolving door at the front of AA and there's more coming. So stick around. You'll get a sponsee. I guarantee it. Uh, Diane, you have your hand up. Hi, can you hear? This is Diane, alcoholic. It's my first time line by line and I'm really glad to be here because I really, you know, I have the book and I uh, keep it in my bathroom just for <laughs> this whole thing that I'll read it. But now I actually read it with you and I only slightly um, what do you call them? Multitask. <laughs> Sorry, but I'm being honest. And I love the honesty of it. Like when I you talk about judgment, I do, I do judge, but um, it's like a reversal of judgment. I'm like that person only drank for a year when they were like 19 to 20. What the hell? Did, excuse my language. What in the world can they know about what it's like to give up decades to have nothingness to just? And I, I call it. You probably heard me before the veneer of existence. And therefore, um, I, I realized that I judge him for not being a mess. It's like, why? And I really, reading this makes me feel great because it reminds me that um, we're here to help each other. And that is incredibly important. And I actually even took down the uh, information on emailing you to be of service for the 164. So I was like, oh, I'm writing this. I don't know what I could do to help, but I thought I, I, I email later. But as far as the judgment aspect goes, everyone being welcome is so important because I know for myself, and I, you, it's interesting when you say match people up, it fits and all that, because I do know that I come from um, like a long line of just disliking myself and judging myself. Like, um, so if I, <laughs> I even have a relative who's going back to become a doctor in her 30s, I'm like, what did I ever do? I did nothing. So there's this self-hatred. And I think the more I do things for other people, the less I feel that way. It is almost like, so I, I don't judge people people harshly i'm glad that i'm accepted and uh i'm also a bit of an, a hopeful agnostic i call myself a hopeful agnostic i i'm really hoping to experience what it's like to have that i don't know um spiritual moment but i do feel the group is my higher power and the acceptance is so important in today's world of nasty social media whatever else we're you know we're bombarded with and to feel there's a place that's safe for everyone and everyone is welcome you know, I, I don't know why it took me so long to actually stay in AA. After my DWI when I was around 30-ish, I had my chance to get it, but I, I didn't get it. I didn't connect. I didn't dislike it. I just never connected as if I was not there. So I, I really um, will always be careful not to judge people just because they weren't a mess their whole life or whatever else. No, celebrities never impressed me unless I like their philosophy. And if I like their philosophy and perspective on life i don't care who they are they're just glad that they you know i don't know we're not political but don't want to burn the forest down you, you get the gist so i'm just happy for their soul not for their that kind of success um but yes i so happy to be and it was a really important thing for me to remember that everyone is welcome and yes i definitely belong here and i will give back more so i can have that experience of helping other people getting out of my soul Thank you for listening. Thank you it. so much, Diane. And, you know, we have to remember it goes the other way, too. Like, sometimes we walk into a room and we judge the room. Um, I liked what Yvette said there, the, the princess recovery or princess something, right? Like, my first couple of meetings I went to were in East Vancouver, and I was from the suburbs. And I was like, I'm not like these people. These are downtown east side people from the, from the other side of the tracks. So I... I judged myself right out of that room. And that's the room where I ended up finding the solution two years later. So, you know, these are things that topics and meetings are great to discuss Tradition 3 in a share, um, you know, so that newcomers can learn this too. Um, it doesn't just go for us not judging them, but it's for them to, to get a little bit of this knowledge as well. Princess Anonymous, that's it. I like that one. <laughs> I need, a, I need to go there. All right. I see you, Gloria. We'll do Karen and then you. Do you not know where your little blue button is? We've got to teach you where that one is. Um, Karen, go ahead. Gotcha. Got on mute. Got on mute. It's good share so far, though. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> Glad you heard all that. No, I like this tradition, too. I, I went, when I first started going to AA, it didn't take too long before somebody had asked me, you know, well, you know, well, what, what, what other kind of medications are you on? 
And I was like, well, I'll take vitamins and, you know, and I said, I'm on pain medicine and go away. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and I've been taking that for a long time. You know, I had back, back surgery that got messed up. And of course I got that look, you know, that look of like, you know, well, you're not sober. And it kind of made me feel, feel weird. And I didn't know whether I was going to come back. So anyway, I kept coming. I got six months and nine days now. And like two weeks ago, I was talking to somebody on the phone, one of the AA people that I talk with. And I said to her, I said, I said, oh, I had the most delicious fish tonight. I said, but beer battered codfish. And she was like, immediately, like I had relapsed. And I'm like, oh my God, I didn't eat like 800 pieces of fish so I could catch a buzz. You know, I just ate a piece of fish. And of course, I immediately started calling other people because I wanted someone else's opinion on that. You know, and I got that, that I'm so glad that with that, the majority of people don't judge and don't judge. I mean, if somebody walks into the AA meeting, I don't care who they are. You know, the whole reason for AA to begin with is for drunks, right? That's some place for drunks to go, not perfect people. So I came there because I was a drunk and I needed help. So I, I, I do like that tradition and that needs to be, everybody needs to think about that. So, all right, I'm good. Pass. Thank you so much, Karen. And, and, you know, just on that question that was asked of you, that's a mind your own business, unless it's your sponsor. Your sponsor has the right to ask you that question so they know what they're dealing with and they know how to approach you. But for everybody else, they can mind their own business. And you can say that as nicely as you possibly can. Um, but, yeah, we talked about the beer battered thing on Sunday. That just is a little... A little far fetched for my liking. <laughs> um, Gloria, go ahead, hun. Oh, I hit your button. Do it again. I thought I hadn't needed to unmute you, but you were ready to go. My name is uh, Annette. I am an alcoholic. I'm also from North Bowford. I like what everybody shared about. I really love this this meeting. I don't have all the books, but that's okay. Um, I really got a lot out of this meeting, and, uh, yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Um, what kind of topics were there? We're talking about Tradition 3 today. Tradition 3? Yes. The only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. Well, my sponsor, like I've been sober for five, 14 years, so that's a milestone for me. And uh, I'm not bragging or anything. It's just, it took me a hell of a long time to get there. I really appreciate AA now. I really uh, have the utmost respect for sponsors and for people that want help because they reach out there and they're at their, they're really desperate or whatever. And, and uh, yeah, I, I also listen to the old timers because they know stuff too. <coughs> And one of the old timers that I knew in North Balfour here who was one of my mentors and he he was a very good, very, very good person. He helped me to get to meetings, get to treatment, get to you know, get my shit together, so to speak. And uh, you know I believe it's this meeting is for all drugs, and I'm a drunk, and I'm still a drunk, um, so no matter what, I, I will always be an alcoholic, so can't change that factor. Sometimes I get my ego, ego deflation, I, I get an ego and I have to deflate my ego uh, about certain things. 
Thank you so much, Annette. Shelly. Whoops, there you go. I got it. Hi, Shelly, alcoholic. Um, I just want to say this is, I love uh, Tradition 3. It saved my life. I, when I came into AA, it's embarrassing, but I didn't know anything about AA. So when I saw this tradition, I was like, okay, I can do this. I, 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 ha I want to stop drinking, but I'm also, um, I had to change my sobriety date seven months in because I also smoked pot and I had a resentment for a long time about that because I didn't understand, I, I couldn't understand that, why I had to change my date, but after being sober for a while, I realized that for me personally, at the time of me changing the date, I wasn't ready. I didn't understand because I didn't have a, a spiritual connection with my higher power. And I and once I had that, I realized, oh, it didn't matter what drug of choice I was using. It was um, being high. I was not connected to other people or connected to um, my spiritual, to my to my God. So um, for me, that. For, for me, uh, Tradition 3 is is huge, um, and just the desire to stop drinking. And also, regarding judgments, I, I judge this person in my home group um, as a homeless, wet brain person. Mm -hmm. And I realized he was not a homeless, wet brain person. He was a brilliant person person who was not homeless at all I don't even know why I thought that and just and now we're friends and it's just one of those things where you just you know your judgments you just don't know what a person is on the outside but you have to look on the inside so I love this tradition I love this meeting so thank you very much Thank you so much, Shelly. That's so funny that you said that because we had a gentleman that was out always at the morning meeting and everybody referred to him as the crazy homeless guy, the crazy homeless guy, and they wouldn't pick him to share. And at the end of the meeting, he left and went outside and it bothered me. Like it just bothered me. So I chased him outside and I spoke to him. He was like an astrophysicist who was just so super eccentric and it was like the neatest dude so it's like so important you know like some of those really really smart people are just super super eccentric and it's just they're and super socially awkward um so it's like so important not to judge and not just that thought for me um lisa g Wow, Tradition 3, uh, Tradition 3, man. Oh, wow, the only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking, right? That's a good thing, because I, I came in and I was a bitch. I came in and I was bossy. I came in and I knew everything about health. And so when they told me in step one that my life was unmanageable and I had a key to inventory and a staff running around, I thought, no, I'm not unmanageable, but I couldn't stop drinking. And the only thing that needed to qualify me for my seat was to not want to be a drunkard, vulgar aunt. 
And that's why I came to AA. It wasn't even because I was court ordered late, late 00 and early 01. My mother wanted to leave Jamaica and I just couldn't stop drinking and she didn't know what was wrong with me. So I promised them that I would go back to those meetings and try again in 01. And they said, good, we don't want to hear about it anymore. My stories and my drunkenness. So even though I didn't really meet the requirement, I knew that somewhere deep down when I said that night of the five of us at the table that, that I, I join you in this wanting me to stop drinking thing. I, I join you, but where's my wine? So when I got to AA, I wasn't a lie down. I didn't take to the not wanting to drink. I didn't have the desire. I'll end with, I had to acquire the desire. And I finally did, and I finally stopped. But without Nick's phrase, if you don't have it, I hope you find it. And I found the desire with you. I couldn't find that desire on my own because I love to drink. To this day, I'd still be doing it if it didn't kill me. Thanks for letting me share. Thank you so much, Lise. All right, we got through all the hands and it's 12. Oh, I'm muted. I'm muted. <laughs> Della's like, It's 12 o'clock and we got through all our happy little blue hands right in time. This meeting's just always perfectly timed. It's wonderful. All righty. So join us again on Friday and we will continue with Tradition 4. I like Tradition 4 a lot. All righty.